Hello and welcome to CTV. This is the first edition of Computer Trade Video, the only television programme to be made specifically for the computer industry. We're setting out to provide the equivalent, really, of a trade magazine, but on your television screen rather than in print. My name is Bernard Falk and I'll be presenting CTV on a regular basis. Now, to assist me today, I'd like to introduce you to two of the most respected journalists in the computer business. David Guest, who's the writer for The Times and a refugee from PCN. Guy Cuny, who, as well as the excellent newsprint feature in PCW, has to be the most televised computer journalist of them all. So who better to present CTV's own news section? Now, later on, another well-known journalist, Martin Banks, will be taking a look at what, if not the most exciting, are certainly the most hype products to arrive on your shelves for some time full function portables. We conducted a short test on the five leading contenders and you'll actually be able to see the results in about uh, 10 minutes from now. Now we're sure that in the next few months CTV will develop into a regular part of your business life. Our objective is to keep you fully briefed on the news items that are most relevant to your business. We'll show you new hardware and software products as they come onto the market. And our cameras will take you to places which you probably never see otherwise. We'll be going inside factories, for example, to watch hardware manufacturing techniques and also to quiz company spokesmen over issues like quality control and reliability, a very important issue I'm sure a lot of you would appreciate in the retail business. We'll also take you inside the boardrooms of leading international computer companies and put the questions you want answered to the men at the top. We'll be putting all of the big manufacturers under the spotlight and investigating just what they do, or in fact don't do, for you, their dealers. Now in just a moment, Guy Cuny will be presenting our industry news section and then we'll be straight into our first major feature on full function portables. David Guest will be presenting the first in a series of light-hearted reviews of the computer press and then our second major story is the first in a series on new business methods. Now this time we're taking a look at exhibitions. It's good for the manufacturers, but a waste of time and money for dealers? We'll find out in a minute. Or could it be that smaller localized versions of the big jamborees are a really effective method of picking up new customers? We'll see. Finally, our major interview this week is with the marketing head of the European company that is fast becoming our equivalent of IBM. Bob Garrett of Olivetti has taken the hot seat and I'll be asking him just what is Olivetti's strategy for the rest of this decade and where does the dealer fit in. Now here's Guy Cuny with the latest news. Right, well, we start out with news of a secret meeting between IBM and its dealers. As one cynical distributor commented afterwards, there's no such thing as a secret meeting of dealers and on this occasion it quickly became known even to rivals that dealers were urging the company not to launch its new PC2 but to keep selling the XT model. IBM has had to postpone the launch of the PC2 because of top management changes, but the Micro is expected now sometime in August or even September. And the plan is to launch it at the current price of the XT. Now that of course means pulling the XT price down, and it would also involve reducing the price of its big brother, that's the advanced technology model AT, which means smaller margins. The idea of seeing margins collapse on the XT doesn't please dealers, of course, and I gather the chosen few who went to this meeting were also a little annoyed to find that IBM still hasn't got over its problems with the AT and only expects to make 160,000 worldwide over the next year. Apparently, the new PC will use Sony-style 3.5-inch discs and it will have the same fast Intel 8286 chip as you find in the AT and whatever you've heard, it will not be anything like the JX model which is sold exclusively in Japan. What this all means is simple. Unless you know more than IBM does, don't place any bets on AT lookalikes until IBM has finalized its plans in this market. Even the AT may have some design changes before it becomes a big seller. That 286 chip, by the way, has been causing no end of problems. There are a lot of European manufacturers of micros who are staking their futures on the theory that they'll be able to run IBM software on their machines by using the 286 chip and concurrent 286 as the operating system. The theory is fine in practice, and the word is, in practice, there's a snag. In the author of that operating system, Digital Research, they've had to start rubbishing the Intel 8286 chip in public. They're complaining that there are hardware faults on the latest batch of chips, and concurrent 286 won't work until Intel changes the chips. Digital Research is also currently under some scrutiny by American observers because of its poor last quarter figures. 
word reaches me that American sales are badly behind the European branch's performance and that many, perhaps half, of the software engineers in Monterey headquarters have had to be dismissed. The good news for digital research is that its latest product, GEM, is being received with rave reviews. It turns the IBM family of machines into an imitation Macintosh, complete with mouse and the ability to draw those funny pictures. That's the good news. <laughs> what isn't being publicized much, however, is the fact that GEM doesn't run under digital's own CPM, but under PC-DOS from rival Microsoft. They may have had to give best to Microsoft there, but there's a sting in the tail. That's the fact that GEM won't run on IBM-compatible machines like the Olivetti M24, the Zenith, or the Commodore. You have to get special versions. Digital research tells me that this is, quote, in order to provide people like Zenith and Commodore with their own brand product for marketing, end quote. In other words, it's deliberate sabotage. It's just coincidence, of course, that digital research has been insisting all along that the only way to get true compatibility with IBM is to use concurrent DOS as provided by digital research, and not MS-DOS as provided by Microsoft. Well, Olivetti does pretty well as a manufacturer of imitation IBM PCs, and according to latest reports from research company Romtech, it's now the number one imitation in Europe. Ironically, Olivetti is now deciding to back a different horse. This is Unix. Olivetti has a joint venture with American phone giant AT&T, which makes a Unix multi-user machine, the 3B2. And their latest stroke of genius is a plan to persuade ordinary high street PC shops to try their hand at selling multi-user micro microsystems. I have my doubts. The problem is simply enough. The battle that Unix will have to fight isn't against MS-DOS, but against Microsoft's own version of Unix, which is Xenix, and particularly Xenix 286. That's right, that's the one that runs on the IBM AT. Now, IBM's plans for next year look increasingly to me as if they're going to include a campaign to push Xenix on its 286-based machines. The two operating systems are very similar, but they're different in important ways, enough to make them distinct. And IBM obviously doesn't want to endorse a product from its big rival, Western Digital, which is part of AT&T's empire. Personally, I'm expecting most of the software action next year to center around Apple Macintosh, Atari ST520, and the most secret of all, the Commodore Amiga. There were secret showings of the Amiga at the Winter Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago this month. And from what little I've been able to hear from there, the Amiga looks like the most powerful of all these machines. I've seen demos of the Atari ST, which make it look faster than Macintosh. And of course, both these machines have color, which means we can expect a lot of speculation about Apple's Mac. If Amiga sells for under 1,400 pounds next year in Europe, then Mac, with only black and white display, will look overpriced, apart from the fact that it already has a lot of software. People do keep saying that Mac isn't selling well, but this is not borne out by the latest American figures. Market research people over there were telling me that IBM certainly dominates the market in terms of sales to the giant corporations, but, they say, Mac is now doing well through dealers, especially since March, when it took 18% of the retail market. That's a lot. And a major reason for this comeback is the software. All that stuff which the programmers have been slaving away on is coming out at last, and it's looking good to the customers. Even so, I do expect Apple to have to beef up the Mac. A price cut, a color version, and a faster version, all of those are on the cards over the next nine months and some perhaps sooner. By the way, rumors that Apple founder Steve Jobs has been selling his shares in Apple don't appear to be well-founded. I've checked the American records on the Securities Exchange Commission, the NEC. Jobs would have to register any shares he sold there, and unless he's done it in the last 10 days, he hasn't. I thought I'd end on a cheerful note with news of some new government support for our industry. In Bristol, a flourishing company called Metacomco specializes in programs for the 68,000 and especially for the Sinclair QL. They recently got some orders from the Middle East and the customs men found the microdrive in the mail. You'll need an export license, said the customs men. Apparently they need it for every single microdrive you sell outside the common market. Why, asked Metaconco. Well, this is a much smaller than a disk, so it must be high technology. And high technology is under a strategic restriction. We can't ha risk having that fall into the hands of the Eastern Bloc. Thanks very much indeed, Guy. Now that seems like an absolutely blatant piece of bureaucratic meddling in what should be a, a perfect... Um, export uh, device. Yes, and I'm, I mean, it could be that somebody actually tried to get this into the hands of the Russians to sabotage their space effort. I mean, you know what the reliability of these things is like. <laughs> to sum up uh, what's happening in the marketplace, uh, particularly the relationship between the retail trade and the manufacturers, uh, is it going to be a good year, would you say, for retail, or is it going to be a very confusing one, judging by what you've told us? I think there's some good deals coming up. I think the retailers are going to be able to do better for themselves. 
as the new machines, Commodore, Zenith, all the other imitations, and the new generation of big machines are going to have a lot. Also, oddly enough, in printers. I think you're going to find some very good deals done in printers over the next nine months. Because it has been very confusing, hasn't it, over very. the past six months, and very disturbing for dealerships. Yes, especially the ones who are dealing with distributors who are going bust. Indeed. Well, a note of optimism. Thanks very much indeed, Guy, and uh, you'll be back with us on the next programme, and we'll be back in just a moment. How do you end the small businessman's nightmare? He's got to run his business and keep the VAT man, his bank manager and auditors happy. Well, you sell him a computer, and then he works all the hours that God sends learning how to use it, or asking you to teach him. Until now. Because Cash Trader from Quest International is the first practical accounting software that anyone can use easily. Cash Trader makes the untapped small business market a reality for the first time. Entries are made in random order and the profit and loss account and balance sheet are automatically updated on the screen after each entry. 18 different reports are available including PAT returns and audit trails. Every small business becomes a worthwhile prospect and Cash Trader comes with support and training built in, leaving you to concentrate on your next customer whilst Quest provides the support to keep your last one happy. Cash Trader is your key to hundreds of new customers. The end of the bookkeeping and VAT nightmare. It started with the Osborne One. It became respectable when the Compact became the first real substitute for the IBM PC. And last year, Data General finally put a full function micro inside a box that truly deserves the name Portable. Now, if Portable means briefcase sized or under, there are umpteen micros available today which deserve the name. Whether this sector will survive as anything other than a range of byproducts remains to be seen. Opinions differ. And some more famous names than others have been reported as saying that the portables market doesn't exist. On the other hand, it seems as if IBM are about to launch a portable themselves, which will probably result in the sector becoming even more important in the short term. High-level strategists in all the leading computer companies agree that distributing a computer power to a wider market is essential. They disagree when it comes to choosing where exactly to invest. Portables are one option, but so are products like ICL's One Per Desk or Acorn's Communicator. They both utilize similar technology to achieve the same strategic objectives, but each relies on a different interpretation of how the businessman spends his time. In two or three years, the full function portable could be a dinosaur, or it could be an essential ingredient of every manufacturer's product range. However, at the moment, full function portables are an important profit opportunity. Let's face it, more and more people do seem to be seeing the benefits of taking their computer with them. Here's Martin Banks to take a closer look at some full function portables and what they can do for your dealership. Any dealer looking closely at the portable computer market is in for a confusing time. Somewhere out there is a little gold mine just waiting to be dug up. Finding it, however, is another matter and whether any of the machines I've recently spent some time with will turn out to be the best spade for the job is difficult to tell at the moment. I've used the words little gold mine deliberately, for in practice there is likely to be a number of smaller market segments for fully functioned portables, rather than one big one. In that respect, the differences between the five machines here today are as important and justifiable as their similarities. The similarity in question is, of course, PC compatibility. The IBM PC has done more for small business computing than any other machine since the original Commodore PET. Nearly everyone who isn't Apple is making a clone of the PC. That is where all the application software development is taking place, so it is a sensible place for the portable manufacturers to be as well. It is certainly sensible enough for there to be consistent rumours that Big Blue itself has a lap portable waiting in the wings. Should IBM actually launch a machine, that will play a crucial role in developing and shaping the portable marketplace. If there is to be a potential for just one kind of machine, then it will come from Big Blue and nowhere else. But the chances are that one machine will not be enough to cover all the opportunities that dealers will find. These stretch from single user to the giant corporate. The applications are just as variable. 
There is a market for powerful and functional systems for the note-taking, diary-keeping, spreadsheet-doodling individual. At the other end of the scale, there are the giant companies that wish to equip their senior and middle management with systems that are an extension of the office, which they can carry around. Here, communications is as important as compatibility with the systems back at the ranch. Other users will want to equip their sales staff out on the road so that order taking can be speeded up and brought onto line via the telephone. Looked at it this way, it should be, soon becomes apparent that there is no point in thinking about these machines on a comparative best buy basis. Each has a place it can fulfill. Some dealers may want to handle more than one to fit, pr fit the profile of the local marketplace. The first machine of the five is the Data General One. This was first to take the Osborne idea and make it small and not hernia inducing. Features that make it stand out from the existing 8-bit lap portables are the three and a half inch floppies, this one has two, full 25 line by 80 columns LCD display, uh, the MS-DOS operating system, and obviously battery operation. The specification for the, the one ranges from one to 8K with one floppy to 512 with two. Also, an optional expansion chassis is available for adding on PC cards uh, and communications devices. At the launch of the DG1, the company said that it was aiming at vertical markets, and as such, it's a sound engine for those sort of applications, especially where it's portability and specialized software that might be applied to a vertical market can be traded off against the cost of the machine. I have with me here Bill Cadogan, who's marketing manager of Data General in Europe. And Bill, as one of the first people who were in the market with a PC portable, what sort of view of the marketplace have you so far developed? Well, it's clearly a, a market which is still developing. Uh, its exact size is difficult to um, pin down at the moment. Mm. Uh, it's going to be driven by the major corporate organizations, I think, initially. Those companies who, as you said, vertical, but vertical markets, but specifically organisations who are particularly service orientated and have a lot of expensive people on the road who need portability, they're the ones who will begin to use this type of technology. There is clearly a market for the single, mm. small user as well. But Given that it is going mainly for the corporate market, where do you see the role of the the dealers, the independent high street dealers? Well, the vast majority of PCs in this country sold to corporate are sold through, through dealers. So what we've done is target our initial marketing strategy to recruit those major IBM PC dealers who are dealing with that marketplace. Mm. That's also one of the first into the market, especially the, the first with a big d LCD display. Um, it initially had uh, a bit of a poor reputation. Have you managed to solve these problems? Yes. In fact, uh, the first uh, model that we produced did lack, uh, w was slightly below the level of acceptability, shall we say. <laughs> you managed <laughs> We've to... now, uh, in fact, introduced a second uh, version of the LCD display, which was retrofitted to all the systems that were sold before, and we've certainly broken that barrier. Fine. Thank you, Ben. My okay. pleasure. Thank you. Next is Ericsson's PC Portable, which is an exercise in getting as much as possible in one box. It's the most comprehensive package of the five, having a minimum 256K memory, going up to 512, a plasma panel display, demountable keyboard, which comes down in front of the machine if you need it that way. It also has five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive, which is PC compatible rather than the more normal three and a half, which is used in these machines. As options, it has a built-in acoustic coupler, a built-in 512K RAM disk, which allows you to copy from the floppy to the RAM disk and use that as a second drive. And it also, back here, it also has a printer. This really is a mobile desktop machine, though ironically it's the only one to have a built-in carrying handle. With all this hardware, it's obviously it's a mains powered machine rather than battery. And I have here with me Mike Bateson of Ericsson. Mike, why did you go for a mains power machine rather than battery? Why, why did you put, decide to put so much in it? Well, this is a fully functioning uh, PC, uh, fully IBM compatible. Uh, we have a large disk store, uh, an integral printer, and a high quality plasma display. 
and that means that it really requires mains power because a battery would be exhausted uh, rather quickly. Mm -hmm. What type of end user do you see this machine going to? Well, essentially the same as uh, for the PC or PCXT, uh, managers and professionals. Um, managers who require the use of a PC uh, periodically, but perhaps don't want the device on the desk permanently. Or for people who could share a uh, personal computer between uh, others in the department. Mm. The, you're talking there the corporate market, also the, the small self-employed people, perhaps? Yes, I think it's applicable for both the, uh, the small businessman and the corporate user alike. Fine. Right, thank you. Thank you. Now we move to two machines which show the spread of the, the form that you can get in portables, full function portables. The first is the Texas Instrument ProLite. Now this is similar in concept to the Data General 1, except that it's aimed at TI's own user base built around the professional desktop machine. So it's compatible with that range of products more than the IBM PC. Its facilities are similar to the Data General 1, except that there is only room for one 3.5 inch floppy disk. It's not battery powered either, although these are available as an optional add-on in a separate box. Other options include an asynchronous communications module which goes in a slot inside there, and a modem. Now TI has said that it's after the value-added resellers marketplace rather than the dealers per se. What they want to see is people who are taking the machine and adding software and systems built around the machine and generating their own value rather than just shifting the boxes. We had hoped that somebody from Texas Instruments would be with us today to discuss this particular aspect. As, uh, it's obviously of interest to many dealers as to whether they perhaps rate as a VAR. But unfortunately, nobody from the company could be with us. So let's move on. This is the Hewlett Packard 110. And for many, this is going to be, mean what portability is all about. The HP 110 is the smallest and lightest of the five that I've been looking at. And it's an ideal machine for use on, on the move. You can use it on a train, in a plane, on a boat, anywhere you like. Its keyboard is nice and easy to use, and it works on the, while you've got it sitting on your lap, which if you're going to be move, using it on the move is important. One of the things about it is it has integral applications built in in firmware, such as Lotus 1, 2, 3 and Memo Maker. It is also possible to load other MS-DOS programs via the optional external disk drive. It's the only one, however, that does not have a disk drive of its own built in. What it does have, however, is a good menu system, which makes it very easy to use, even without the manual. You can just pick it up and start. It's the most oriented of the five to the obvious spreadsheet memo-making requirement that the travelling businessman might have. And it's a good successor to the 8-bit machines that have uh, been very popular so far in the marketplace. I have here with me to discuss this Steve Smith, who's a product marketing specialist for the HP range. Now, Steve, do you see this machine just going for that spreadsheet memo-making market or do you see it going elsewhere, anywhere else in, in the market? Um, certainly the machine is aimed at existing users of Lotus 123. Mm -hmm. um, we see the portable market as a companion to desktop PCs, so that portable machines should be able to allow the user to take that computing power that they're used to out of the office and onto the streets in, in their working environment. Mm -hmm. On the move. Yes. Yeah. 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 Now this is the, as I said, it's the only one without an internal disk. Um, any reason for that? What was yes, the trade-off? Yes, um, the reasons we decided on an electronic disc other than a, uh, a mechanical disc is primarily for portability and robustness. Uh, we feel that the environment that this machine would be used in um, is an environment such that mechanical discs may have very severe reliability problems. And by allowing the machine to use its electronic disc, you have all the advantages of mass storage online, but without any of the reliability problems. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Last but not least is the grid case range. This has styling that comes from the older grid compass machine. That was a military system, and that's why this one has a 50G specification, so it's pretty good if you drop it. 
is a battery powered system with a mains adapter and it has MS-DOS in ROM in a socket under here. This also has four, three other sockets in which you can load up other application software uh, that is put into firmware. There is also available Grid's own operating system, which personally, in a very brief introduction that I had with it, I found them just a bit better than MS-DOS. It also has an integral single 3.5-inch floppy drive plus a 5.25-inch drive in a separate box. There are, in fact, three versions of the Grid, two with LCD displays and one, this one here, in fact, with the plasma screen. It's not really just a single machine, as some of the others are. It's part of a comprehensive package of equipment, which includes a 10 megabyte Winchester uh, and a file server for networking PCs and grids. So when they're out, on the field, out in the field, on the road, uh, this is pretty real distributed computing. Earlier, I spoke to Ken Coulter, who's managing director of grid in Northern Europe, and I asked him why they had gone for MS-DOS as well as their own operating system. Well, the answer to that, Martin, is that back in 1982, when we introduced our operating system, MS-DOS wasn't really on the marketplace. But obviously, we wanted to cater for both the first-time user with our own operating system, and secondly, with the more experienced computer user. CPM was very prevalent at that time. And we decided that uh, with the success of major packages such as uh, Lotus and uh, uh, WordStar and packages like that, that we wanted to offer the user a choice. So not only to cater for the first time user, but also to cater for the very experienced micro user. So we offered in the middle of 1983 MS-DOS on the product and we've literally stuck with that ever since so that we offer a choice really to both types of user. I then asked him, as MS-DOS applications are mainly aimed at individual users, whether he saw Grid case being something dealers could sell as a one-off. Well, certainly Grid's target market um, has always been the major accounts uh, marketplace. But um, now, as you say, that we offer both uh, operating systems on our product, we also want to cater for the people who want to buy one or two or a small company who wants to buy three or four units. And certainly, uh, we have started in the UK with a distributorship uh, operation and we're also building up a small dealer network. And we would obviously like to add to that and we would like to add to the value-added reseller market whereby people start off with one or two systems as a pilot and they then uh, grow. I mean, the whole objective I would say to you about the new grid case products is that they are the first products that will do everything and more that a, a desktop will do and will you know, actually fit into a briefcase. And therefore, the individual user carries a lot of things in his briefcase. Uh, why not a portable computer? So yes, we do see um, a dealer network playing a very important part in Grid's distribution strategy. That was Ken Calder of Grid Computer. So there you have it, five machines in the PC portable marketplace. And what is important about these machines is that they intrinsically point the dealer towards a marketing philosophy that fits the product stocked to the requirements of the local market. Despite their obvious charm and technical wonder, these systems are not cheap, so selling them on a box-shifting basis is unlikely to succeed. They could, however, make interesting engines for some profitable value-added systems, with the dealers being the ones to add and keep the value. Thanks very much indeed, Martin. Now, we will be pleased to hear your views on portable computers or indeed on anything which you think your colleagues and other dealerships would find of interest. In future editions, we'll have a letter spot, and if we can get any interesting discussions or arguments going, perhaps we'll ask the combatants in to confront each other face to face. We're also looking for interesting case studies, perhaps on one of your customers. Tell us how you've solved a complicated problem or developed a unique application. We'll be happy to sing your praises if you'll let other dealers share the benefit of your experience. Thorny and I have asked us to talk to you about their new total support service. Now, it may be of some surprise that none of the other distributors have come up with this idea before, but perhaps it's only a company with the strength and resources of Thorny and I which can afford to invest in what seems to be real added value for both the dealer and the end user. 
The total support service is intended for a selected number of dealers who can match up to some pretty tough entry qualifications. However, once you become an authorised dealer, some valuable benefits will follow. In the first place, you become eligible for consignment stock. In effect, Thorne finances your stock holding by providing you with a choice of up to 24 pieces of software and a free display rack. Now, this is the desktop display. We'll be taking a look at the floor standing unit in just a couple of moments. Total support service dealers will also enjoy fast ordering facilities, free product training for your staff, and technical support by telephone hotline and field representatives. But to many dealers, the most attractive part of the package will be all the marketing support that Thorne is planning to put behind it. You can certainly expect to see this seal cropping up all over the place. And if it's also on your front door or your shop window, well, the benefits are obvious. For the end user, Thorne's advertising promises that a dealer has committed himself to providing full customer support and technical assistance on demand. It also says that here is a dealer who recognises that to provide a high standard of service, he needs a broad product range at different price levels, which is regularly updated with the best new products as they come onto the market. So, let's take a brief look at some of the products which Thorne is offering as total support service stock. Now, this is an example of the sort of display stands that are available to authorised dealers. To start with, there's all the perfect products. Perfect Writer, it's a comprehensive, easy-to-learn word processor. Perfect Filer, that is a powerful record management system. And Perfect Calc, that is a full-function spreadsheet whose commands are compatible with the other programs in the series. Now, here we've got the SMB business software range. SMB standard, and the packages include sales, purchase, and nominal ledgers, as well as invoicing and stock control. The systems are easy to set up and to use and can cope with the accounting routines of nearly all businesses. This is SMB Plus. It's the next step up. A range of sophisticated, multi-user, multi-company, and multi-currency software, which will satisfy even the most complex needs. Now, most importantly, there's no cost involved in upgrading from SMB Standard to SMB Plus. Thorn will transfer all existing data free of charge. Introduce you to Jeff Abbott, who's the UK sales manager. Jeff, um, when you examine the concept behind this, what is in it for the dealers? What, why would they want to go for a package like this when, in fact, uh, they can make money by selling individual boxes? This concept provides the dealer with total support, also the ability to have stock in the, in the, show, in the showroom at no cost to himself until he's sold it, which means he doesn't have to invest in stock in the first place and pay for it before he, before he actually sells it. He has it there when he, he pays for them when he sells it and reorders at that point in time. He gets extensive credit facilities, uh, a good margin. He actually gets 40% margin on all these products. 40%? 40%, which is very good, especially if he doesn't have to pay for it for 45 days on average. Additional to that, we provide them with total marketing support and technical support for our hotline. The marketing support taken the form of product displays, as you said earlier. Yeah. And the advertising campaign through the TV and press. So they will come in on the back of that advertising campaign? All the leads, in fact, that we acquire from advertising campaigns are actually passed on specifically to TSS dealers. I see. That is it. Now, therefore, we're prone with leads as well as the financial backing for the, for the whole product. Would you anticipate that this is the kind of thing that uh, people will have to look at in the future? I think it's absolutely essential that the basic, the, uh, the, the main dealers in the country take this sort of concept because it gives them the ability to buy all their software, from, like one-stop shopping, buy your th software from Thorn. So the objective has to be sort of think Thorn for your software. That's what we're trying to do. Jeff, thanks very much indeed. So, there you have it. An exciting idea and one which, for a limited number of dealers, offers the promise of cash in the till now and increased customer loyalty in the future. Now for another feature that we're planning to make a regular part of CTV. As I said at the beginning of the program, we've got a lot of time and respect for our colleagues in the computer press, so I'm sure they won't mind us having a little fun at their expense. In any case, David Guest makes his living working for the computer press, 
So if anyone's entitled to take a critical look at what's been printed in the past few weeks, here's David Guest with What the Computer Magazines Say. Take it away, David. Welcome to the computer industry's answer to the Tower of Babel. Welcome also to the silly season. As summer approaches, lassitude overtakes the weary hacks of the trade press. PCW catches the mood. Maybe I'm getting old. Then again, maybe the micro world is just becoming a little boring. For a nation of eccentrics, the UK has produced surprisingly little talent here. Among the precious few is the benighted Sir Clive, who grows more precious by the week. The Guardian summed it up. Quite frankly, would you risk loaning £15 million to someone who arrives in a C5? Another is the old brain drainer Adam Osborne. Microscope, telescoped since its, weekly, its move to weekly publication, has his measure. Not necessarily nasty. That man, Adam Osborne, came through London last week with his normal laid-back style. Osborne is betting his company again on his own vision of what the market ought to want. But they have their hiccups at the big system end of the trade press as well. Following a rare joke last week about Legionnaire's disease, computing got serious again in its latest issue. US mini computer manufacturer Apple Computer? Computer Weekly, incidentally, is soon to be produced on glossy paper. Previously, it was just dull. And what are they putting in the tea at Computer Talk? Its page four lead headline announces a story about something called Tripper, but the product turns out to be called Trigger. Finally, the scribes at Datalink have discovered a revolutionary system that will make users extinct. Presumably to avoid mass hysteria, it's tucked away on page 11. Morrow claims to have come up with the first battery-operated portable computer. There have been battery-powered portables, but a battery-operated one? Look out soon for battery-operated word processors to replace the trade press. <laughs> That'll be the day. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, David. In every edition of CTV, we'll be setting out to bring you not only news and product information, but also meaningful advice on running your business. We've lined up features on sales training, finding out and negotiating for premises, raising capital, recruiting staff, you name it. If it's in your interests, we'll feature it. Now, to start with, we're looking at different methods of gaining new business. We'll be looking at the entire sales process, from attracting the initial inquiry to actually closing the big deal. But we'll start at the very beginning. How do you first make contact with a new business prospect? Advertising? Direct mail? Cold calling? We thought to begin with, we'll take a look at exhibitions. Olympia here in the heart of London is one of the premier exhibition centres anywhere in the country and a right and proper setting for this young, vibrant and exciting industry, the computer industry, to hold its Info 85. Now it's not only a shop window for computer manufacturers from all over the world to show off their wares, you can also see the response from the general public is quite overwhelming. So why not follow me on a tour around the exhibition? We've come to Info85 to meet some of the leading micro-manufacturers and to see how they're showing off their latest products. Of course, at a show like this, there are all sorts of glamorous and exciting techniques used to attract customers. But we'll also be talking about smaller exhibitions, the sort of shows that dealers themselves can use. Info85 is not just about computers. As the name suggests, information technology is the common factor between all exhibitors and it's interesting to speculate how that in turn will affect the microcomputer dealer and his product range. Now, as you might expect, one of the most futuristic stands at this exhibition is being run by digital, largely because this is a company which has quite dramatically lifted its profile and its image to the general public and the computer industry as a whole in very recent years. With me is Mervyn Woodward, who is the sales manager of manufacturing and new equipment business. The style of this exhibition seems to reflect what you're trying to promote when it comes to imaging. This has come about through a determined effort to create a consistent digital image in here in the UK. Digital is the most underknown company amongst all the large computer companies. We've tried consistently over the last 18 months, two years, to build an image which reflects our approach to computing and make people realize that we're here, we're here in the UK to stay, and we've got something to say. 
what have you got to say? What is, what is that message that you're trying to put over? Digital has emerged from being a purveyor of black boxes to be the information systems company here in the UK. Well, I'm not sure that everyone would agree with that. And one person who certainly wouldn't is Alex Monroe, marketing communications manager at Data General. I asked Alex how recruitment of dealers for the new Data General One is progressing. So far it has been extremely encouraging and we already have repeat orders. How many dealerships have you got? At the present moment we have about uh, 40 to 50 outlets and we're looking for 100 by the end of the year. Are you ready? Okay, well good luck and good selling to you. Thank you very much. On the stand of Brother, one of the most famous names in typewriters and now in word processors, and exhibiting a whole wide range of new electronic machines, business systems, and of course word processors as well. And with me is uh, Mike Brownridge, who's the sales manager. What for you is the real benefit of an exhibition like this, and how does that relate to what the public really want? Well, the public have a great need to thirst for information, and what we're really trying to do is expose the products and what the products will do and hopefully that's what the public will get when they come on the stand. The public are really offered a wide choice. Surely the hard thing for a company like yourselves, a manufacturer, is to attract them to your machines and to explain why they're somewhat different and better than the machine on the next door stand. That's right. There's always a tendency to view everything as being the same under the skin. But in practice, what we're trying to do is actually use high technology to produce a wider range with better features and added value. And that's really the essence and the difference between ourselves and some of the other people on the exhibition. How would you explain your relationship and the importance in your marketing and selling strategy of the dealer, the high street dealer? Right, well, the dealer's got a very important part to play because what we do feel is that the end customer wants to be supported. And there are so many examples nowadays of cut and run. So what we're interested in doing is providing a very strong framework of support to the dealer so that he, in turn, can pass that on to the end user. Exhibitions like this demonstrate the extraordinary development of computer systems and information technology in recent years. Just a few years ago, an exhibition like this would have hardly attracted very many members of the general public. But over 30,000 people have come here in just a few days because this is a shop window for the entire industry. And just looking around the exhibition, you can see not only how big that industry is, but how many people actually want to come here and see it. What do you suspect is the value of an exhibition like this? Uh, I'm very surprised at how many people have actually come. Basically because technology is going so fast, you've got to keep abreast of it. There's only one way to keep abreast of it, is to come to an exhibition and see what's going on. What is your specific interest? Interest in the Canon 7 series, the new legs of copy as well, the, the updated copiers. Why Not, is that? <laughs> faster, more facilities, more efficient, newer technology. Yeah, and presumably you work for Canon? No. So that's exhibitions from the manufacturer's point of view, and a glimpse at what the typical user attends a show like this for. So what about exhibitions as a sales tool for dealers? In the first place, when the manufacturers attend a show like this, what happens to all the sales leads they pick up? Where do all these customers actually end up spending their money? I bumped into a fellow journalist down next to the Wang stand and asked him how he felt the sales process worked. Do you suspect that people will come here, see the equipment and then go along to their dealer, their high street dealer, and perhaps um, try and then buy it there? Depends okay. entirely what the equipment is. Some yes. of the products go through dealers quite easily and well. Others are still very specialised and uh, need the input from the manufacturer with the research to help the buyer. Finally, how do you analyse the relationship at the moment between manufacturers and retail dealers in the computer industry? Some of it's been fraught with problems, hasn't it, in the past? It has. There's a lot of skirmishing and a lot of uh, dealing, trying to get more um, backup from the manufacturer. But dealers are growing and they are getting more and more efficient in their field. Uh, and computer operators, computer manufacturers are appreciating that the dealer is there at the front end and can do a good job for him. Thank you very much, Mr. Hill. Who do you work for, principally? I'm a freelance. Right. Over on the ABS stand, I asked Chris Pullen a straight question, what happens to all the inquiries that come in at the exhibition? We process them dependent upon what the inquiry is basically interested in. Obviously, uh, a seahorse inquiry will go to a seahorse salesman and so on through the range where our inquirer is definitely interested in an orb or a tall microcomputer, 
we send them directly out to our network of dealers. I think ex exhibitions are ideal for dealers. Obviously, a dealer can't be expected to come along to an exhibition like this, although at the exhibition today we have three of our dealers actually on this stand showing their software. What we try to encourage the dealer to do is to come along, to set up a smaller roadshow type of event in a hotel or any sort of place like that where they can cope with a limited number of people at a fairly modest price on a modest scale. And what kind of support will you offer? From our point of view, we will help them out by supplying graphics, a portable display system. Uh, I'm sure most dealers have seen Mile Haley or something of that ilk, which we bring along. Plus, we tend to supply them with a couple of our people to support them on the technical side or on the sales side. And Mervyn Woodward of Digital have a similar message. We ourselves do quite a lot of that. Uh, we take over local hotels in our own regional district areas and put on this more, more intimate uh, exhibition for local customers and prospective customers. There was one other person at the show I would have liked to introduce you to. I think all the dealers watching this program would like to know the name of your company. Oh, I'm sure they would. I think most of them have found it. Actually, we've been besieged. So that's our brief look around Info 85, an exhibition which has proved to me at least that the general public are prepared to come to places like this in vast numbers to see the very latest in information technology. But CTV isn't just here to report on the exhibition, but also to launch ourselves. We're a unique video magazine, the only one which is geared specifically for your industry. So if you're into computers, then you're into CTV as well. And what better to launch ourselves Charming girl, you're not boy George's brother, are you? Chum. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> good luck to CTV and Cheers. good luck to the industry. Cheers. <laughs> right, 20 seconds to give me your answer. Which IBM compatible PC has a 256K memory, twin 360K disk drives, a faster processor, and four free expansion slots, all standard? High capacity Winchesters and networking optional extras. One of the world's biggest names in business machines. Actively recruiting additional dealers. Hmm? But what's the name? Canon A200. That's it. Hello. My name's Jeff Hawkes, and over the past few months I've been speaking to some of you about the benefits of advertising on CTV. Well, as you can now see and hear, unlike other trade magazines, CTV provides the perfect opportunity to demonstrate exactly what your products can do in a concise and extremely cost-effective way. CTV reaches key business microcomputer dealers. Information about your products is essential to dealers if you are to stay ahead in this very competitive industry. Your advertisement can show them who you are, where you are, and clearly convey your message to those people who really matter. CTV can be incorporated in any media schedule. If you want results, make it part of your marketing mix. Please call me, Jeff Hawkes, on Godalming 25888 for details of how you can advertise on computer trade video. Now, each edition of CTV will contain a major interview with a leading personality in the computer business. Today we're talking to a man who holds what must be one of the most exciting and demanding jobs in the industry. Certainly his company is the micromaker of the moment. And with a rash of takeovers and cooperative deals within the first six months of the year, it looks as if Olivetti is pursuing a determined and carefully thought out strategy. Well, is it? Bob Garrett is the marketing director of British Olivetti. Welcome to the program, Bob. First of all, tell me this. We've seen the tie-up with AT&T, the a called Takeover, a link with Control Data and Toshiba. Now, does this mean Olivetti is actually setting out to become a European IBM with a finger in so many pies that it's impossible not to take a few bites of it? And what are the implications of this <laughs> high profile for dealers? Right. Certainly, we believe that we are the only company in the world that can actually take on IBM because no other company has a range of products and the size of financial strength that is necessary to do that job. Uh, Why do you want to take on IBM? IBM have the largest market share in computer business and we believe that we have products which we can offer which are superior and therefore we should bring those to the customers. When it comes down to the image of Olivetti in order to do that, and we're now talking about marketing, selling and how it will relate to the dealers, do you think you've got the image right? IBM is now almost like a household name, mm -hmm. whereas Olivetti was famous at one time for 
for typewriters. Yes, I think it's true to say Olivetti has been a household name in most countries in the world for a long time as a typewriter manufacturer. For the last certainly four or five years, a larger part of our business has been data processing. But of course it takes time to establish that name in the households. I think in business, uh, our name is accepted now as a DP company. Uh, so really it's just in the general public's mind, perhaps still typewriters. What are you, gonna, what are you offering dealers when it comes to the selling of your product? Mm -hmm. We offer, apart from the product itself, which um, goes without saying is far better than our competitors' products. Well, you would say that, wouldn't <laughs> of you? Course. Um, we offer a very good level of support, both local support through account managers, uh, central support through helpline facilities, uh, and our marketing and advertising support. A very important thing we believe is to help dealers to advertise and market the products that we are giving them in the most effective way. So we assist them from a logistical point of view, perhaps telling them the best media to use, uh, the best way to do it, and also helping them financially. What about financial packages, though, in order for them to, uh, to hold large amounts of stock? At the moment IBM are offering financial incentive incentives on, a, on software for a sale and return basis. Are you giving them active physical support in that way? Yes. For about the last um, 18 months to two years, we've been doing what we call a stock financing plan, which basically means that a dealer can buy equipment from us for him to demonstrate or perhaps just hold in his stock and not start paying for it until the following month and then spread the payments over about five months. And he pays no interest on that. What about sale and return? Sale and you return... You don't like that, really, no. traditionally, because it sets a negative posture when it comes to actually acquiring the stock in the first place. Yes. But IBM offer it, why mm -hmm. don't you? I think, basically, if you're giving sale or return on, for example, software, the problem is the dealer has got to know all the software he's going to sell. And if you start giving sale or return on 50 or 60 packages, the only way the dealer can manage to do that. We prefer the dealers to know the products they want to sell, and that means they must invest in training, in their own support people, and therefore the actual buying of the package is a very small part. You see this as a, um, as a partnership, uh, a two-way thing? Absolutely, yes. Now you've linked up with AT&T, which is essentially a, a communications group. Um, is it possible that uh, eventually there could be a conflict of interest in the actual manufacturer of products? I don't think so. The agreement with AT&T is something which is continuously being, um, not modified, but being progressed in different directions. The original agreement was that, uh, that AT&T took 25% of Olivetti and a new 25%, so it expanded the financial backing. Don't they have a right, uh, is it a four-year period, to actually buy Olivetti? They have a right to increase it to 40% Which would four years. essentially give them control? Um, no, I don't think so, because the other shareholders are quite large. But so they, they would mean, still be, uh, they would be the major shareholder, yeah. but by no means be able to control the complete functioning of the company. Um, but when I say conflict of interest, I mean, our information is that the M24, which is sold as the PC6300 in the United States, is actually doing rather badly. Uh, what you tell us is that it's doing extremely well. Yeah. So, th whatever point of view you take. But this leads us on to the danger that perhaps AT&T will cut its losses and sell Unix. Now, if it does that, what about the dealers who've invested in that? In the PC, you mean? That's right. I don't think Unix and the PC are actually competing products. Unix is a multi-user system. MS-DOS on the PC is a single-user system. There is always an overlap, but they are distinctly different products. And one particular movement we see as being very important at the moment is that our division of British Olivetti that sells our 3B mini-computers, which come from AT&T, are talking to PC dealers about selling those products as well. So we consider the two things to be complementary. There isn't a danger, you don't think, that AT&T will, will, uh, will sell out eventually or get out of that market? I think it would be very, very unlikely. It is their intention to become a major DP company. Uh, the other question, which I know dealers are absolutely um, insistent that I would ask you, is when you're going to go in and sort out uh, a company which you have a controlling interest in, a company which has been the bane of their lives for some considerable time now, and that's Acorn. Mm. Well, Acorn is owned by our parent company, not by British Olivetti. So, really, uh, my contacts with Acorn are very, very um, negligible. But, but you um, must know what's going on. As far as the, the UK... At the moment, not very much. Well, as far as the UK market is concerned, there's been no intention for Olivetti to change the way that Acorn work. Uh, the well, don't you think they should? If Acorn are making money, then there's no reason why Olivetti should change their strategy. 
Well, I, I suspect that most people in the industry would actually disagree with you and say that Acorn, first of all, is an extremely bad product for dealers because their profit margins are cut considerably and uh, because a, a percentage of that has to go to, to the BBC mm -hmm. and that the entire strategy over the, uh, over the launch uh, of uh, their new product, uh, the, uh, the new BBC product, is in fact a complete disaster. Mm. I don't know the home market machines very well. The only thing I would say on the margin side is that home computers have always had and will always have a lower margin because the prices are much tighter. Mm. And that is why more and more home computer dealers are trying to move up to the PC market and PC market dealers are looking at moving up to the mini area. But what you're really saying, in fact, is if dealers have got a really major complaint about Acorn, and many of them have, that they don't talk to you, they should talk to the United States. Mm. No, they should talk to Acorn. Right, directly? Yeah. And your involvement or your... Well, your we, forty percent in Acorn is irrelevant. Well, our uh, parent company has members on the board of Acorn, so they would receive those complaints. Let's go back to the link with AT and T, which is very important because essentially it opens up an entirely new market when it comes to the field of communications. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about that and the way in which dealerships can actually profit by this vast increase in the communication side of their industry. Right. The original idea behind the agreement was that AT&T would take some of Olivetti's products and sell them in the United States, and vice versa, we would take AT&T products and sell in the UK. Now, setting those up takes some time. Yeah. Um, AT&T have, for example, announced a network in the States called Starlam right. uh, that is scheduled to be available later on this year. Products like that we will be looking at the marketing of in the UK. Uh, but, of course, those are new products. So really, while the agreement started at the beginning of last year, it takes some time for new products to come through to the actual sales area. But do you think there are going to be major sales opportunities which our audience can benefit from by looking very carefully at this entire communications field? Absolutely. Communications in PCs is the direction in which everything is moving. Is it? More and more people want to tie their micros onto their mainframe. They want networks. They want access through electronic mail. There's so much more that can be done, so much more margin than to be made. There's been, uh, it's so rapid, this industry of, of, of yours, uh, and ours indeed, uh, <laughs> that it's very hard sometimes to actually stand back from it and look at what's going to happen in a year's time, because everything mm. seems to change so, so dramatically. Right. How would you forecast, when it comes down to the retail trade, that things are going to develop, advice that you can put over or opinion which can enable our audience to actually profit from their own industry? I think the direction in th which things are going at the moment through distributors uh, will continue and that is that the support that the dealers offer is becoming more and more important because they have to compete with other dealers and therefore the support they give their customer is of prime importance and that is why we believe we must give the dealers the support they require as well. It's also a question really of efficiency uh, in the industry itself, an upgrading of the general standard of service because there's been yes. too many cowboy high street operators and back street operators right. leaping into a fast market yes. and, and you predict now that it's going to actually transform itself, that the good people will be the people who will survive. Yes, or the people that are willing to invest in their future. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the importance of training. Yes. That is going to become more and more important, particularly as communications becomes more used. Mm. So the job uh, with the cigarette dangling from his mouth behind the counter has which you course. unfortunately still see an enormous amount mm -hmm. of, particularly in the Tottenham Court Road area, <laughs> he, he is going to be a figure of the past. Yes. Well, Garrett, Marketing Manager of British Olivetti, thanks very much for being on our first show. Okay. And uh, that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. This has been, as I say, the first edition of CTV. We hope you've enjoyed it and found it useful. We're back next month with some inside information on the laser printer market, and we'll be speaking to several other leading personalities, big names, in the computer business. Until then, goodbye, and remember, you saw it first on CTV, and keep watching.